Hi, my name's Dr. Diane Shanley. I'm a clinical psychologist and the director of the psychology clinic at Griffith University. Griffith University is also the home to the NCNED, or the National Center of Neuroimmunology and Emerging Diseases. This center is leading the research literature on MECFS, or chronic fatigue syndrome. One of my interests is helping patients adjust to living with chronic illnesses, such as MECFS. Patients with this disease often have challenges getting the practical, financial, and emotional support to help them cope with the illness, to improve their quality of life, and to minimize any further deterior deterioration. Many MECFS patients struggle to accept that since getting the disease, they have started to react severely to things that they love, such as exercising, socializing, working, and to everyday items like perfumes, cleaning products, noise, food, and light. They can also have difficulty finding practitioners who have training in the latest evidence relating to the illness. Ketra is a patient of mine who has MECFS. She lives in a nursing home due to her profound level of disability. This video consists of a four minute photo story of Ketra's journey with MECFS, and it gives insight into how devastating this disease can be. It also has short talks by the healthcare team who are helping Ketra to improve her health and who spoke after the Gold Coast screening of the movie Unrest. Thank you, I hope you enjoy. Hi. My name's Ketra. This is my story. I've always loved the water. In high school, I can remember the guidance counsellor saying, you're good at science and love sailing. You should be a marine biologist. After school, I went to sea and did my skipper's tickets. Working as a first mate or chef on luxury yachts for years, I had a great life. I loved the travel. And by 25, I'd sailed a lot of the world from Istanbul to the US, Panama, and Brisbane. And like most 25-year-old female yacht crew, I knew my days at sea were numbered. You need to be young, very tanned, and preferably blonde for those jobs. No one stays young forever. I knew my life was going to change dramatically in the next five years. But I didn't expect this. I'm now 32 and I live in an aged care facility on the dementia ward. I spend most days and nights in my room staring at the ceiling, resting. When I first got sick with ME, it was very confusing. I looked healthy and if I did nothing, I felt healthy. But any exertion would cause sore throats, headaches, and body-wide pain. Then I became sensitive to light, noise, smells, and most foods. I had to stop walking. My heart rate would hit 220 just walking to the bathroom. Then after sitting or laying down, it would plunge to 40. I'd have chills and then burning pain all over for hours after each trip. I tried so many things to get better. Supplements, medications, IVs, everything I could. But I got worse and worse. Thinking became too hard. I couldn't imagine colours. Words lost their meaning. I just counted breaths to get through the pain. It was very tough. But watching my mum get sick was much harder. Knowing what she was about to lose and seeing her go through the same illness cycle of hope, denial and suffering was really difficult. But now we've learnt to listen to our bodies. I know that when my feet get cold, it means I've overdone it. If I start to feel hyper or rushed, I've also overdone it. I won't take any medication that makes my heart rate jump as they aren't good for me in the long term. I've also learned about avoiding artificial and natural chemicals, scents, noises, anything that triggers my symptoms, I avoid. And I meditate a lot. The thing that's helped the most, though, 
is heart rate based pacing. I think that anyone who's newly diagnosed with ME or suspected of having exercise intolerance should probably get a metabolic test and learn about the safe zones and resting heart rates. I'm lucky that being in aged care with lovely carers and nurses has meant that I've been able to rest enough, stay within my safe zones and my heart rate, and to slowly improve. I can now let a little light into my room and into my life. I can enjoy colours, touch therapy and friends. But aged care homes are not appropriate for ME patients. We need quiet, chemical-free areas, and we need people to accept this disease for what it is. It's time for unrest. There are millions missing. I wish my story was unique or even rare, but it's not. There are over 250,000 Australians with this disease. Millions of people missing from their lives around the world. And Jen Breer, an American woman, made the movie documentary Unrest, which I decided to screen on the Gold Coast. Because I'm bedbound and can't walk, I asked for help from the online MECFS community and Josh and Kathy kindly answered my call. Along with my mother, we screened the movie Unrest and I invited the health professionals that have helped me with my health to come and speak about the best ways to support patients now along with the researchers from the National Centre of Neuroimmunology and Emerging Diseases about their latest breakthrough research. Now we're going to move into the uh, the speaker's phase of the evening. Can I ask to come to the stage Professor Donald Staines? Donald Staines is the co-director with Professor Sonia Marshall Gradisnik at the National Centre of Neuroimmunology and Emerging Diseases at uh, Griffith University. Please welcome Donald Staines. Um, well, thank you very much for that introduction and uh, what a wonderful crowd we have here this evening to see a truly remarkable film. Um, perhaps it, it'll be almost impossible to describe all of our research and our achievements uh, in five or ten minutes, so I'll try and summarise that and maybe there'll be time for questions later. But first I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleague and co-director, Sonia marshall Bradesnik, and also our wonderful team of young researchers, some of whom are here this evening, uh, who do just a a fantastic job. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the many patients who have assisted with our research and who've made blood samples available, and we couldn't do that without you. What I would like to do is just give a very brief summary of what we set out to do and how far we have come. When we set out, we wanted to understand the pathology of this illness. We then wanted to develop a diagnostic test, and then we wanted to develop candidate drugs that could be used in treatment. If you have been following our research, and we have published, gosh, maybe 50, 45, 50 even more papers since about um, 2012 um, in the scientific literature, and we take a very uh, firm view that it's all about the science and the litmus tests for that are the publications that you get in peer-reviewed journals. Without making it too complex, I would like to say right at the beginning that we believe this will be found to be a treatable disease. What we haven't got yet is the complete proof of the nature of that pathology. However, we've come a long way. We now understand that a group of receptors or ion channels, which have really relatively been uh, discovered, by that I mean the last 15 years or so, And they have a critical role in allowing iron such as calcium into the cell. Now, without making, again, that too complicated, it's absolutely critical to understand that ions like calcium are fundamental to how cells all through the body uh, behave and how they fulfil their functions. This particular group of 
receptors or ion channels, they're called transient receptor potential ion channels. A rather clumsy name, but there's a good reason for it. And they're located in the brain and spinal cord, in the pancreas, in the heart, in the gut, in the metabolic and hormonal systems, um, and just about everywhere in the body. And importantly, when the, you find them in the brain, and there's only uh, in the last few months have there been papers published about uh, their location in areas such as the brain and spinal cord. And their main function there is in support of the white matter, the supporting part of uh, the cells that um, enables neurons to do their job. Now, by isolating or at least identifying these receptors in the white matter of the brain and spinal cord, we can get some insight into what the term encephalomyelitis means. Because you may be aware there's been some scepticism in the medical community about that term, because normally you would expect that to be infection or inflammation. That's really what the itis in that uh, term means. However, when those cells have been looked at in the brain um, or different tests have been used, it's been a very evasive pathology to really understand. So it's really not so much, as I said before, about discovering a pathology of inflammation or infection or even of neurodegeneration, such as multiple sclerosis and so on, but rather a change in the homeostasis or the normal function of the white matter in the brain and spinal cord in support of neurons. So in other words, they can't do their job properly. The other component about the term myalgic and myelitis is that these receptors are also heavily engaged in nociception, recognition of noxious stimuli and pain, and aberrant stimulation of them, either suppression or stimulation, may in fact be a root cause for why the pain is so severe in this illness. So that's some insight into the pathology. These receptors are also located in the pancreas and they have a fundamental role in insulin, fine tuning, insulin production and secretion. And they're also associated with other parts of the body, as I mentioned, but also the general urinary system, the gut, uh, and so on. And other members of this family have an important role in cardiac function. Remember that for the heart to function properly, there has to be the right strength of contraction, there has to be the right rate of contraction, and there has to be the right recovery period after each contraction to allow uh, the heart to function normally. So it may be that they're associated with this as well, because as we know, in some patients there's a very severely dis disabling condition called POTS, possible orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So the point I'm trying to make is that we're actually now beginning to understand what this pathology is about. The second part I wanted to mention is the development of a diagnostic test. That was our second aim. We are well advanced, we believe, in forming the basis for a diagnostic test. Clearly, we are very cautious in the terminology we use. All of the evidence that we have must be scientifically rigorous, but we're moving forward in being able to try and describe what are the changes to these critical receptors and why do they occur. We believe that fundamentally there is a change in the genes that transcribe these proteins that make up these receptors. And as it turns out, a particular receptor, the TRIPM3, which we've published, um, has the highest number of isoforms or different types of it in the group um, of any TRIP receptor and that they are also widely and diversely located around the body. Some of them having, you would expect to have uh, complementary or consistent activity, some of them may actually be antagonistic. So it's a very, very complex thing that we're dealing with. However, the diagnostic test will be based primarily on the genetics of those receptors, which are also known as uh, threat receptors. And Professor Pete Smith will talk more about that later, I'm sure. So what happens, we believe, and in our clinical experience, at least 60, 70% of patients, as many mentioned in the film, become ill after an infection. 
and it doesn't seem to matter what the infection is. It could be a virus, it could be a bacterium, it could be a parasitic disease, and they appear to recover somewhat from the infection, but then some other catastrophic event happens. And by way of speculation, we could say that maybe, just maybe, it's that assault or threat of that infection that promotes expression of the wrong type of the proteins of the receptors. In other words, aberrant receptors are produced which are simply not functional. And our, our research has shown that there are less of these receptors being expressed and they don't work properly. So we believe that's a fundamentally important concept to formulate a diagnostic or at least a screening test. And we're working on that very hard at the moment. The third point about what we set out to do is to uh, develop drugs or to look at drugs uh, which may have a therapeutic benefit. This is a very tough job because there are groups of receptors that have literally hundreds of drugs or ligands or uh, molecules that impact on these receptors and signal them one way or another. Sometimes they're inhibitory, sometimes they're stimulatory. Uh, it's a very much a mixed bag. And in fact, probably 60% of all drugs in use today have an effect on a group of receptors known as G-protein coupled receptors. And that's just to illustrate that the receptors, which are not the same as that, but let's just say broadly speaking as receptors, means that they are amenable to drug intervention. But that's going to be a terribly long haul to actually identify which drugs are going to produce which effects. Because it's becoming clear to us that not only are there clinical differences between patients, but as we've seen in any one patient, there can be a variation of the clinical presentation. And that includes that cycle of relapse and recovery. So this is a very complex illness, but we think it can be explained. The complexity is because the number of these receptors is probably much greater than you might find in any other disease. And that the nature of the changes in these receptors is such that a treatment or drugs you might find is suitable for one patient may not be suitable for another. Anyway, that's not going to put us off. It's just another dimension of, of difficulty that, that we add to this. So I just want to finish on this point that I often hear people say it's an incurable illness. Well, as someone said, they, they might have thought that about diabetes at one stage, but by developing a drug, insulin, based on what occurs naturally in the body, then you may not cure the illness, but people can lead a reasonably normal life. So that's the kind of scenario that we might envisage uh, happening with this illness. So we don't believe in phases such as incurable. Uh, we don't believe that the barriers to finding suitable drug treatments are insurmountable. Uh, we actually think there's every reason for optimism. Thank you. Our next spe speaker is Dr. Georgina Gibson. It gives me considerable pleasure to introduce Georgina, who is actually a friend of our family. Georgina is a great cook. She is also a general practitioner from On The, Je on the Park General Practice. Please welcome Dr. Georgina Gibson. I can't actually see you all out there, but I know there's lots of people. I think it's wonderful that we're all here tonight, and it's a huge credit to Ketra and Josh, who've got us all together to try and understand more about this brutal illness. I watched that film, and my heart sunk. I'm sure some of you will be devastated by what you saw in that movie tonight. But I also think that with the work that Don and Sonia are doing, we should feel very confident that there's optimism. I felt embarrassed to be a doctor hearing some of the stories on that um, movie. And I think we as doctors have to get much better at saying, as Jennifer Bray said in her TED talk, I don't know. I can tell you're sick. 
I don't know what's wrong with you, and I'm not even sure how I'm going to help you. But at least admitting we don't know is a damn good start. Hopefully, in years to come, we'll have the treatment of MECFS as part of the medical curriculum. We certainly don't at the moment. I just wanted to mention that I think the role of GPs is often the one of filling in all the forms, the forms we have to fill in for um, oh, universities and schools and work when patients with MECFS can't work. Certain exams need special consideration, so then we have to also try and help our patients get funded through Centrelink and sometimes insurance. It is the most humiliating, demoralising experience for most patients with MECFS to get anything through Centrelink or an insurance company. It will be made so much easier when Don comes up with a test that we can do and write on the form, this is the score on this blood test. Right now though, we're left with very little in ways of objective measurements of this condition, but there is one test that I learned not from med school or from journals, but from my patients. Thankfully, my patients are sufficiently up to speed with MECFS treatments, but they've educated me that there is a site called the Bateman Horn, the Bateman Horn Centre in the US, who've developed a test that helps us check for orthostatic intolerance. Don just mentioned this POTS syndrome, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Many MECFS patients suffer from it. At the end of the movie when Jennifer was dancing with her husband and she sort of wilted and collapsed on the floor, she was probably suffering from orthostatic intolerance. If she'd been dancing probably a bit faster, she may not have collapsed when she did. I'm just going to quickly run through a couple of slides because I appreciate most of you aren't doctors and you won't be doing these tests on yourselves. But I think those of you who are patients should make sure that you do have this test done because I think it's a useful screening tool to compare how you're travelling through the journey of your illness. First of all, when you're going to do this 10-minute lean test, you need to educate your GP, so I suggest you download the brochures that Josh did for me and bring them in so that um, you can prepare for the test. I, my practice nurse does these tests now and they can be done in about 15 minutes. Patients need to be prepared, they've got to have um, withheld fluids to less than a litre over the previous 24 hours, etc. A few medications they must avoid. It's all on the website. Here are the photos that go with it. You're going to lie your patient down, they're going to be in comfortable clothing with their socks off, and you're going to try and wait till their blood pressure and pulse stabilise. Then you're going to stand them up against the wall, looking at their feet. Just ask them to lean on the wall. I think that's so they don't fall over. Then you're going to monitor their pulse and blood pressure every minute while they're standing there, if they can last for the whole 10 minutes. During that time, look at their feet. I think these might be Adrian Wooding's feet, Petra's mother. She obviously stood up for a while, and in no time at all, that's what her feet looked like. I think it was two minutes it took for that to be the appearance. That doesn't happen in normal people. People who've got you know, their autonomic nervous systems not working properly get this sort of an appearance. This is the sort of um, chart that you, know, you might use to do a recording like this. And these are the sorts of findings that you're looking out for. And it's an unusually um, high change in systolic blood pressure, so the systolic blood pressure drops. An unusual fall in diastolic pressure. Sometimes, however, the blood pressure actually goes up. But what often is very significant is what's called the pulse pressure. The difference between the high blood pressure, the systolic, and the diastolic gets narrowed. As Don mentioned, though, we also get this racing heart <coughs> syndrome. Now, I think the next slide might be some figures of a real patient. Now, isn't that a shocking slide? I'm sorry to do this to you. 
What I just want you to notice though are the things highlighted in red. They're the things that the, the readings on this particular patient that are abnormal that would indicate that she is suffering from POTS syndrome. The most remarkable one of them is actually the last row where you see the change in heart rate over time. She started with a resting heart rate of 62 and at the 10 minute mark she got it up to 128 doing nothing except standing. That is not normal. That's what that looks like on a graph. That was the systolic blood pressure. That's what, that's what the heart rate changes look like on a graph. So that's all the slides I'm going to show you. But I hope that that's just a little bit of hope and inspiration for people to at least go and get their case documented. Certainly whenever I'm referring patients on to other healthcare providers, which is the role of GPs to sort of somehow try to coordinate all the other care providers involved in a patient's life. Mentioning that this test has been done might just get you over the line and convince that health provider that this person is absolutely genuine. So hopefully I'll be able to take questions later if there are any. Thank you for listening. Our next presenter, Mark Barrett, is a physiotherapist who is passionate about health and fitness and is responsible for metabolic testing of physiologic in Rabina. He uses cutting edge technology to measure metabolism and exercise capacity and uses heart rate mon monitoring to help his ME CFS patients. Please welcome Mark. Thanks uh, everyone and, and thanks very much to Ketra, Adrian and Josh for inviting me here tonight. Hopefully I can uh, shed some light for you. Um, I thought I was talking for 10 minutes but I realise it's five so I'm going to zip through a couple of slides here. Um, you can see here a test being conducted. Uh, these tests are done on a treadmill or on an exercise bike and, and basically we're measuring a number of physiological variables. I uh, won't go into that too much but from the data collected from these tests, we, we can build some good educational pictures for, for people. So uh, this is uh, the metabolism, energy metabolism of a healthy person. We can see on the left, um, easy aerobic type exercise, um, moving across to the right to more anaerobic exercise. And we can see how a, a person's uh, fuel burning, their fat and carbohydrate burning changes in that time. This is a graph of a pretty healthy uh, aerobically fit individual um, and we can see good rates of fat and carbohydrate burning there. Another important thing we do in the test is analog, uh, um, uh, measure some threshold points and those uh, threshold points in a healthy person might, might occur at quite a high intensity of exercise, certainly running. Then in contrast to this, we can see the aerobic metabolism of uh, someone with MECFS and you can see there's a stark um, <coughs> contrast there. Um, much diminished ability to burn fat, much diminished uh, aerobic um, capacity and, and much more reliant on anaerobic um, uh, metabolism when they work. We also see that the thresholds um, uh, can occur at much lower work rates and it's important even for an athlete to, to not spend too much time above these thresholds but certainly important for someone with MECFS to, um, to not go uh, above those thresholds and we can see those happen at much lower work, work rates in, in these people. So I guess when we analyse these graphs and compare the difference to healthy individuals we have to really come up with a new definition for exercise because our standard definitions for exercise don't really suit the um, MECFS -E case. Um, for example, with anaerobic, uh, with anaerobic threshold, it, it might take a healthy individual running at quite a reasonable pace to reach that threshold, but someone with uh, MECFS may, may do that with activities of daily living, including housework or, or even just personal hygiene um, activities. So, 
that makes us they have to think very differently about what is exercise um, for someone with ME-CFS. How do they manage that through the day when, when many of your daily activities become uh, exercise? And then on top of that, we also have to consider that this person is going to recover from exercise uh, much more slowly at a much slower rate than, than we traditionally cover, recover from exercise. So we, we have to, on top of building this uh, new picture of what is exercise, we also have to map in the recovery. And, and that's where we start to bring in concepts like pacing of doing activities and resting and doing activities and resting and so on through the day. Now, in terms of pacing and, and heart rate, um, we saw those thresholds before that, that we measured in a test. Uh, heart rate monitors can be a useful tool with pacing because you can set the heart rate monitors to alarm when you go above certain thresholds and that's giving you warning signs that you need to rest or schedule in rest and recovery. Heart rate also um, can help define for a person when they are actually resting and recovered. So heart rate monitors can be useful there. And, and looking at heart rate data retrospectively over time combined with things like activity and symptom logs can help someone build a, a framework for themselves, a, a picture of what activities they can uh, get through in a day and, and how much rest they're going to require around those activities. I mean, everyone wants to live a full life, so uh, pacing is something that requires a lot of, uh, a lot of um, discipline on the part of the person and, and it's very difficult when you want to go out and, and do things, do social things, live, do normal uh, sort of daily living things that you're missing. Uh, so heart rate alarms can be a, a good way of keeping you in check and, and keeping you honest and maybe even helping your carers keep you honest also. Then we come to exercise therapy and, and I think you saw in the, in the movie earlier that exercise for a lot of people with ME-CFS is just not even possible. Um, we have to really exercise therapy and talk of that has to come with a big warning that it's most important that any exercise therapy doesn't actually make the person worse because when they crash it, it can be for weeks or months. So, so whether a person can exercise or not is really the first question. Um, then if they do exercise and are embarking on some sort of exercise therapy, that those exercise uh, programs just need to be massively uh, modified compared to what we see as a normal exercise model. Uh, loads need to be drastically reduced uh, and by that I mean the intensity of the exercise drastically reduced to a point where people might even start their exercise programs with exercises on the floor. The interval of exercise, uh, of a particular exercise um, set uh, needs to be controlled and, and really uh, uh, marked recovery strategies need to be added. So again, recovery from an exercise set may be laying on the floor and certainly much longer than we'd normally use in, in exercise programs. So um, when we're dealing with exercise, we need very uh, gentle programs that, that are really well thought out by good exercise physiologists and, and physiotherapists um, because, with a good understanding of, of what's going on um, with this condition um, because uh, there is a very high risk of symptom exacerbation and, and that can last for, like I said, weeks or months and, and that's definitely what we want to avoid. Okay, thanks. Our next presenter is Professor Pete Smith who is a leading Australian allergist and immunologist from Queensland Allergy Services in Southport and Brisbane. He's a professor in clinical medicine at Bond and a, clinic, a specialist clinical collaborator at Griffith University within the National Centre of Neuroimmunology and Emerging Disease. Emerging Disease. Please welcome Pete Smith. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is an interesting mixture to be giving a talk at. So, um, 
Thank you, I do, I do. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, very humbling to um, see such a film, so thank you very much uh, for the opportunity and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's great work and uh, I look forward to uh, make things better. Sometimes the world lines up for bad things and that's what these genes appear to do. Sometimes they line up for good things and uh, there's been a really good alignment of specialists and researchers and research students as well as um, clinicians and patients and the patient force has actually led us to a very interesting place. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to ask you some about immunology aspects and um, I think it's like in the film, uh, doctors know nothing about this condition. Uh, we do know a little bit but there's a lot of information out there and very small numbers so what uh, Professor Staines has stressed, we need to get good data and we need to know where this is coming from to even look at treating it. From my point of uh, view, um, there's multiple overlapping symptoms of this disease and many different phenotypes. And from an allergy point of view, uh, one of the interesting studies that the group that found at Griffith is that mast cells, which are an allergy cell, get activated and there's more of them. We're not even supposed to find them in the peripheral blood, but in patients with uh, MECFS, the uh, team at Griffith has been able to identify them and have a couple of papers on them. It's an interesting aspect. But also they interact with nerves. Nerves, when they're staying in danger, tell these mast cells, which are professional immune cells, to get involved and help us. We know mast cells get activated when we have a splinter or a mosquito bite, they swell up, they itch. In the bloodstream, it's happening on the inside. I see patients with non-allergic rhinitis, and many of you will actually be cringing in your seats as you see all these triggers, which is the Cincinnati Irritant Index uh, Scale. These typically hit uh, a receptor called trip v one which we know is expressed in greater amounts in patients with chronic fatigue. And when I've uh, been invited to have a chat to the team uh, about where on earth do we go looking for this, um, I thought V1 was going to be involved. But interestingly, it forms dimers with trip a one which picks up smoke and cold and uh, cold air. Uh, and trip v one is increased in patients with irritable bowel. The V1s in many patients with knowledge of rhinitis have brain fog and sensitivities to certain chemicals, which uh, Julie may mention, odours, and they have allergies or hypersensitivities. <coughs> many allergists, when you are negative on skin prick, say, haven't got allergies, fine. Um, I've had patients being told they need to go and live in a bubble, which is hardly what you uh, wait several months to see a specialist for. Um, when we actually challenge uh, this, the airways in patients who are hypersensitive, we get ranges of pain, hyperalgesia. Um, and depending on which doctor you go to, they're often very focused uh, and will see different conditions and you'll have various names for the condition uh, as well, depending on who you see. Um, and getting the big picture is that we're still searching for that. When uh, uh, Dr. Sain Professor Sainz has mentioned when nerves get activated, they release neuropeptides and that can affect blood vessel tone. Um, and there may be over release of these compounds, and they have been found. These also affect other sensory nerves and affect mast cells. So we actually have a you know, complex clinical symptom, and I've just drawn these in bubbles. But these bubbles may vary or may be absent for some people. And some people may have predominance of autonomic regulation, they might have hyperalgesia, chemical sensitivity, or fog. So um, I was asked to you know, come in and the whole team were looking at that and they actually decided, okay, let's go have a look at trip receptors. They look like a reasonable target, it hasn't been looked at. And there's 27 of them in humans and interestingly when they looked, um, the team looked, they found three just repeated that message there. So they're there and these are, many of these ion channels are involved, they're in thermodetection, chemical perception, nociception, um, and they're involved in detection of threat. They found also an acetylchine receptor involved in that threat response. But as you know, not every animal responds the same way to threat. We see many animals, deer in the headlight, and I'm sure many people in the room have seen this, we see you know, withdrawing from the threat and saying it's too hard, let's uh, remove ourselves. Some animals respond very differently, and in fact I'm sure, uh, my, I'm speaking to my patients and I listen to them, they feel like that, or feel like that on the inside, but can only do that. So when they see threats going around, so you have these mixed responses. I'm not trying to minimise or trivialise it. I'm trying to say I get it. Um, so at this stage, we don't have the answers. As Don said, we have hope. We are getting there. We are getting some real answers uh, due to the great work of great people. Um, my clinical focus is looking at reducing the threat stimuli. Uh, and reduce the threat reactivity. There are some chemical ways of doing this. 
um, decrease the ion channel activations and there are ways of doing that. Increase resilience and part of that, uh, if where appropriate, is exercise training. C get diet is part of reducing the threat. Um, and the N of 1 trials, the anecdotes, the YouTube videos are not the, the answers. We need good randomised controlled trials based on genotype that we're actually in the process of doing. So that's where I'd, I'd like to sort of summarise and leave it and say thank you to everybody for tonight. Thank you. Our final presenter is Julie Albrecht, who is a dietitian and nutritionist from Ju Julie Albrecht's and Associates at Food Body Life Banoa. Her career spans 20 years, both practicing, lecturing, and consulting about diet and health. She is passionate about helping people with food intolerances, allergies, and sensitivities in chronic diseases. Please welcome Julie Albrecht. Thank you, everyone. Um, I must say, I was also humbled by that video, um, and I'd like to thank Ketcher and Josh for inviting me to talk this evening. Um, I have the, had the really wonderful opportunity of working with some wonderful patients who have taught me a lot about this condition and, and um, encouraged me to broaden my mind and how I look to try and assist them in their journey. And one of them, I think, is here this evening, Rosie. Hi. Um, I think when I see a patient who presents like Rosie did, how many years ago is it, Rosie? Five years now. Um, it really makes me question about how we go about and do our assessments and I think it's important that um, we actually take some time to listen to these individuals and take some details about their medical history and their symptom profile because we can learn a lot about what those potential triggers are and what those threats that Pete mentioned. We need to look at their total body load with respect to every aspect of their life, not only food but also their environment the time they spend interacting with others all can have a huge impact on, on their symptom presentation and their recovery. And of course their environment from things like, as Pete talked about, petrochemicals, but things as subtle like cook curtains, people's clothing, their beddings, their mattresses, the dust in the room, all of those things need to be taken into consideration. Acknowledging that people with this presentation vary from from um, in their presentation, so we need to make sure that we individualise our approach. And lastly, then, there's the food. Um, in some patients, we have challenges with major proteins, whether it's gluten or other grains. We have problems possibly with dairy and soy, and possible and naturally and added chemicals, as Ketri mentioned. And all of these, to investigate these and to identify what a, a particular issue for a patient takes time and takes a lot of persistence and assistance from their carers. And as I mentioned before, we also need to look at the environmental components that are in their world and how they may influence their symptom presentation. And then the other challenge is, is to make sure their diet's nutritionally adequate, which for some people we can't actually have them have an adequate diet because their diets are limited. We put foods back into their diet, they end up with a reaction. And then there's another challenge of trying to supplement them appropriately, which they also react to. So it's, um, it, uh, it's definitely a condition which makes you think outside the box in relation to how you manage and support these people in their journey to reliving and regaining their lives. I think one of the things they've taught me in working with people with uh, ME and CFS is that you need to be quite particular about what you're doing. You need to pay particular attention to what they're telling you because a lot can be learnt from them. Sometimes it's the simplicity of their lives that brings them on the journey to recovery and I can definitely say that in Rosie's life. Um, without her persistent and caring mother she wouldn't be where she is today back um, now attending university, which is a far cry from where she was in a wheelchair when I first saw her, the nasogastric tube at her nose and with her head swung down in a chair and not able to communicate with me. So, well done, both of you. Um, and the dogged persistence that I've seen in them um, to keep on 
persisting to find the answers that suited Rosie to have recovery, I think is a wonderful lesson and, um, and not an easy journey to bear. Um, I'd just like to thank you for your time this evening and uh, once again, all the best to all of you. Thank you. I did say that Dr. Diane Shanley was due to speak. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to be with us. We do have two slides which I've been asked to speak to. Uh, Diane Shanley is the director of the Physiology Clinic at Griffith University and is a practicing psychologist who focuses on how to help people cope with being severely ill. So we, we, uh, we have four, four bullet points here. Uh, the role of psychology in MECFS. Firstly, to assist clients in recognizing that they have a chronic disease. Assist clients in redefining their lives to accommodate this disease. Assist clients to cope with the sometimes intense debilitating emotions relating to the disease and assist clients in managing the disruptions the disease causes to their work, school, and family lives. If anybody is seeking more information, we might just leave that slide up there as we enter the question and answer period. In terms of testing, it, it, as we've heard, it's very um, heart-wrenching for uh, particularly GPs who have to deal with this issue all the time of um, enabling a diagnosis which will be accepted by the um, economics, uh, health economic system of, uh, of healthcare. And it's, with all diseases, it's basically saying uh, you don't have it unless there's a test. We're very confident that we will have such a gold standard test, and I can't, I don't want to put a time on it, but in the not too distant future, we're well advanced in that now, and that hopefully that will be the major change uh, that will enable um, the Medicare system, Centrelink and so on, to more officially recognise the illness and to give some benefit to patients who have been struggling for so many years. There is, uh, as far as good randomised trials, what, what I mentioned in there, there is very little uh, that's, that's uh, done in uh, good randomised clinical trials with well-defined patient populations. Um, there are supplements that may help. Having less inflammation in your body is better, but uh, what uh, unfortunately does get peddled is hope and expectation, and these things are very often very expensive. Uh, if you're doing something, make sure you're doing no harm. We're talking about some of these ion channels and the way they might be activated. And, uh, as Professor Stone and I was having a chat before, some of these um, have you, what we call U-shaped kinetics. So what uh, will block one, at, block something at one dose, changes it at the other, changes it will actually irritate it. So you've got blocking to irritation with the same compound. And when there's change in the way that struck that uh, receptor may be, there's a shift to the left or the right. So that what is normally helpful dose may be harmful. So my main message is, is it, make sure it's got logic, preferably do it in discussion with the doctor, have small amounts, don't, don't try too much and uh, if it's not making a difference, move away. That, until we get better, good evidence-based factors, our, our adage in medicine is do no harm. When you look at it really objectively in terms of scientific benefit and proper, properly conducted scientific studies, uh, two things. One is that supplements um, do not necessarily stand out as being beneficial. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the, the amount of money that is spent on these is just extraordinary uh, for people with a very limited income. So I think the way to look at this is to, is to turn it around and say, when we understand the pathology, and we're very close with that, and that we can develop a diagnostic test or tests if there are differences uh, within the pathologies, to then come up with properly um, conducted and properly derived uh, chemicals and drugs that will be specifically beneficial for that particular subcategory of illness. Um, and 
As I say, we're not too far away, but we've just got to keep at it. And I think the other thing to be really careful of is that Pete raised before is that the normal dose may, you may actually have an adverse response. And when I think of the patients that I've worked with, that's probably generally what I see. Um, and the unfortunate thing is they've often spent a lot of money by the time I get to see them. So, um, yes, I think logic and getting some appropriate medical support and guidance would be a good way forward. Can I just add too to that, there's some enormous amount of money that gets spent on potential um, supplements that might help. Patients with MECFS are very vulnerable to magical cures. I actually think with the work that Don's doing, there will be some hopeful treatments in the very near future. In the meantime, I suggest all that money gets put into saving up for your motorised wheelchairs and fantastic internet access, because that's probably what saved you as a patient community, being able to talk to each other on the internet and do research. And don't go and get all the quackery that's out there. The uh, amount of money invested in research compared with other conditions is incredibly small in this illness. And part of that, and I think this would be fairly widespread knowledge, is the confusion and perhaps lack of clarity that uh, the funding bodies have had about the illness. There simply hasn't been the evidence for them to say, this is what this illness is. And in fact, I think as Nancy Climas, the um, doctor from uh, Florida mentioned, um, it was about having a name for it, a nosology. You know, what, what kind of illness is this? And for many years, people looked at autoimmunity. We know it's not an autoimmune condition. They thought it may have been a mystery virus, and a lot of time was spent and energy and money spent on trying to diagnose a mystery virus, which was never found. So what we believe we're seeing is a very unusual manifestation of a genetic mechanism which is causing a change in these receptors so that they become essentially dysfunctional. Now, in that sense, this is really a standalone illness. So until um, medical funding bodies and research funding bodies around the world come to understand that this is a novel illness, this is, you know, we haven't got a category of this illness before, and that we're seeing this for the first time, even though it's been around for decades, if not longer, then maybe that will send the message and the impetus to the research funding bodies that it is time for change and research funds should come into this illness. I'd just like to add a little bit to that. The team at Griffiths has done remarkable work. Don was mentioning 50 publications. A good academic might be doing two, three publications a year. They're putting out 10 in that unit. Um, they have fought for, sought hard, worked hard, and achieved good funding. They could certainly do with more. And as a public, uh, as a group, if you're making attention to this uh, condition, yes, services, uh, having young care, I think is uh, a point that was made by Ketra, getting good patient uh, care and facilities, uh, which should be an emphasis of a, a group being politically active. I think medical research and attention to the condition as a real condition, and be damn proud that this uh, team here at the uh, at Griffith are actually leading the world in this condition. The it is challenging. Seeing somebody like this is a good hour plus of work just on first touching base. So. Um, Going out there, I, I certainly don't have time, you know, I finish the work after 10, 12 hours a day, of work a day and find it very hard to actually sit down and think beyond that. Um, at Emerge Australia we've asked patients to put forward recommendations of doctors that um, will treat a condition that they um, have found to be helpful. Most of us feel we've never been validated and it's hard uh, to go to doctors or professionals of all sorts that just don't believe you, that think you are a malingerer or a hypochondriac. Um, so 
tonight and seeing so many professionals for the medical um, side of things come, it yeah, it just gives me hope um, that that we will be validated and that something can be done to help us because the services that we need um, are important uh, to help people have a better life.